are live, guys, with Dr. Jessica Babbage. Today we're going to be talking about postpartum recovery, vaginal birth recovery, C-section recovery, and some tips about uh, weight loss after pregnancy. So uh, this is Dr. Jessica Babbage. Jessica, you want to tell your tell them a little bit about your background? Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a physical therapist, a doctor of physical therapy in New York City. I specialize in pelvic floor rehab, sports medicine, and orthopedics. I also own my own um, clinic in New York City. So I treat and see a lot of people with pelvic floor dysfunction, and I'm very passionate about women's health and women's health awareness, and also a medical advisor for the Femme Health, and it's been great. So lot, like, um, just love spreading the awareness to get women feeling great thanks. and feeling yeah, good in their body. For being so. here and for being part of yeah. our team, because evidence-based information is just so important so important uh and as someone who has been through two c-sections and reached out to you before you joined our team to help me through that uh, i definitely can uh i can say that it's been really really mind-blowing and interesting to know what i didn't know um chatting with you about you know what i should be doing after after having a baby so um let's get into the basics so what are the main differences in terms of recovery when you're talking about um, a vaginal birth versus C-section? I think the main difference that we have to think about is that when you've had a C-section, it's a right. major operation. <laughs> and we don't, I, like, we don't really think about the, what that's like for somebody when they're healing. It's basically, it's very similar to a vaginal birth in the sense that there, you need time to recover, but the differences are pain management, being aware of scar tissue healing and making sure that the wound is fully healed. And then also there's going to be lifting restrictions. So a lot of times I see postpartum moms, postpartum people um, kind of wanting to get into physical activity and physical fitness too early. And... I think that that's something that I'm really passionate about is that making sure that people have the right guidelines of how to feel good in their bodies and how to get back because, you know, PT, especially pelvic PT is kind of um, still really not that known. I'm always surprised when I get patients that come in and say, oh, no one told me about you or no one told me that I could be helped. And I think that for most people, we think after a knee surgery, you'll get a referral to PT and you have guidelines, but after a C-section, major operation, it's like, oh, no referral, right. and here's the baby to take care of. So I think that we want to be, like, in terms of a C-section, you typically will start to feel better within that two-week period where vaginal birth could maybe be a little bit faster, but there's still the timing that we have to be sure of with, like, making sure the incision isn't getting infected, making sure it's healing, and uh, making sure that we're doing all the right unexpected steps. for me when I had my C-section was the tightness that I felt months later. And that's when we had spoken. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about just like how scar tissue can affect C-section healing and just what that means for a lot of women who are trying to get active again? Yeah. So that's a, something very common too, that people will say like, okay, we had the baby C-section, taking care of everything, feeling good. But over time, the scar needs to adhere down in order to heal, but it can adhere into your muscular layers, into your organ layers, and that can affect your bowel and bladder function. It can affect your digestion. It can affect your movement. So if you're having back pain or shoulder pain, it could be because all of that abdominal fascia is like getting pulled in and tight in that scar tissue. And I see moms years out even because the scar tissue can continue to develop for at least two years after a c-section so it's something you want to be aware of immediately you want to understand like how you can get it moving and like right immediately postpartum with some breath work and then once it's fully healed you can touch the scar directly but then years later you want to make sure that you're still making sure that the abdominal fascia can move because a lot of times people come in they're like i'm getting a uti i'm getting a uti they're not having positive UTI test, but that fascia is so tight and their pelvic floor consequently gets tight because their core isn't kicking in well enough to, to provide healthy pressure and environment. Right, yeah, those. the thing. Um, so, and of course, yeah. before starting any physical activity, make sure you get cleared from your OBGYN and you know don't start things too early. Uh, I think diaphragmatic breathing, which we do have another video on, um, led by you, um, is one of those things that I think is pretty easy to start you know, pretty much right away. Is that safe to say? I don't want to. 
<laughs> yes. Like I always recommend that um, people come to PT like prior to birth just to get an awareness of their body and to know like how pre much pregnancy changes you because after having a baby, right, we always think of the newborn baby, but there's also the newborn mom. Like your body is so different and diaphragmatic breathing is the very first part of core retraining. So we hone this in a lot. And even when I see a mom like six months out and they're like, I'm feeling great, but I'm leaking or this is happening. It's like, well, let's get back to the diaphragmatic breathing, being able to breathe into your back, into your pelvic floor through that whole 360 area to make sure that everything's kicking in and clicking the way that it should. So immediately after birth, whether you've had a C-section or a vaginal delivery, sometimes I have those patients that are like really gung-ho and are like, I want to know exactly what I can do to start. And breathing, being able to breathe into your front, sides, back, down, all of that is super foundational to um, rehab and to getting back into those higher levels and it's, of fitness. It's funny you said because so. it sounds simple, but as, as, when you taught me how to do it, um, I will say that it's it's not as easy as it just as it looks but of course you know you can practice and i think it's i mean i'd love your opinion on this but i feel like it needs to be pretty mindful when you do it like it's not something that you necessarily always have access to but we have to be aware of it so in general most of us tend to be upper chest breathers but if we're always living up here and we're always clenching our abdomens that's an unhealthy environment for our pelvic floor so our pelvic floor tends to get tight and what is it, 90 people postpartum complain of some sort of sexual dysfunction or pain within the first year postpartum. So it's like you want to make sure that you're able to really breathe down and get that whole area right. like moving well. After a vaginal birth, so. you know, some, some patients have to have um, an episiotomy and uh, stitches. And so how does that really impact recovery? I would say for the patients that have had to undergo an episiotomy, it is a lot harder for them versus letting somebody kind of go through it naturally and go through the chairs. If you've had, if you've had an episiotomy, it's harder because you're cutting through the perineum, which is an important area to kind of keep the pelvic floor. It's like the central tendon for the pelvic floor. So if you cut through that, it needs to go, it needs to heal up and develop scar tissue. But then if it's too tight, it can make it more difficult to access your pelvic floor and also create some aches and pains and even hip pain things very similar to a how a c-section would be and the same with perennial tears if you get into those more severe tear, tears like a grade three or four where you may need some stitching you don't want to neglect that scar tissue and as we talked about earlier like the best way to start with scar mobilization in the early phases is can you breathe into the tissue because breathing helps to create length it improves blood flow it can help to get those areas moving but if you know that you've had an episiotomy if you had a tear with stitches you definitely want to like get a mirror out, look if you haven't seen a pelvic PT or um, OBGYN or anybody recently and just see, hey, is that creating some of my pain? Is this stuck? Because we want it to be able to move. So in I had read directions. somewhere that, and I wish I could quote the exact source, I can't remember right now. But, you know, if you could predict like the level of vaginal tear someone was going to have, like if it was going to be a small one, you know, most of those heal up fine. But if, so, if, if a physician who's there delivering the baby, like, you know, is really concerned, wouldn't an episiotomy be better, or maybe it's a better question for an OBGYN, but, you know, wouldn't an episiotomy be better than an unpredicted, like, really severe tear? Because then, at least with the episiotomy, it's kind of being cut in a controlled fashion versus, like, just, it just, like, tears open and maybe, like, very difficult to, you know, stitch back up properly. I think that's a really good question, and I haven't had the pleasure of being in a live birth, so I'm not sure how, um, and I never want to, like, step on anyone's toes when it comes to this, but I would say, based off of the evidence and just how fascia moves, if your, like, birth is a natural process, and if we allow, like, time and, like, allow the fascia to, like, relax and stretch and open up, the research shows that 85% of first time moms delivering vaginally will have a grade one or two tear. It gets more significant the more we intervene with it. So if we get in there from the research, this is all research based, I like haven't been in a live birth, but um, so I'd be curious to see what some OBs say about it. But the OBs that I know and have worked with, we talk a lot about how like less intervention is better and like 
even within the pushing phase because your pelvic floor doesn't push the baby out it has to relax to get out of the way so if you can do like a warm compress in between any of those things now in an emergency if the baby's half there and there's something going on then yes like whatever we can to save the mom save the baby but now another really popular topic um and new moms um are maybe worried about concerned about is weight loss after pregnancy it can be a polarizing topic but um but there's people that want to know about it so we definitely want to we want to at least talk about it a little bit here so what what would you say are kind of some of the key principles to keep in mind for people who are concerned about weight loss after surgery uh, not after surgery but people who are concerned about weight loss after pregnancy um you know what's like a like what should they expect? What's a good time to get started? Um, and, and maybe put more energy and focus into that if that's what they're, you know, want to do. I think that's a really honest and good question because it's everybody always wants to kind of get back to where they were. And some moms like feel great immediately and they kind of rehab quickly and they're not breastfeeding or they stopped breastfeeding and they feel like they can get into a routine quicker. And then others, it takes like a longer time and they're shocked by how birth has felt on their body and there's so much going on with like that newborn mom that newborn body with like the hormone fluctuations and the ligamentous um laxity just some structural changes that you really have to hone in on and create some stability around so a lot of moms want to know when they can jump back into a routine and honestly i think we have to really change the way that we look at fitness and the way that we look at how to create results within our bodies. So 80% of weight loss is probably nutrition, right? We have to be honest with ourselves about like, well, if we're breastfeeding, like, what does that look like? We need more calories. What types of food are we intaking? And then when we go into fitness, sometimes if you go too hard and your hormones are still adjusting, and then that we have the cortisol level, if you're not sleeping, that's going to also delay your progress. I have actually learned like the more and more I've been doing PT and personal training, like how much rest and recovery is. And we think that that off day isn't going to help us. And it actually does. So what I try to teach more to my moms is like in the beginning, let's rebuild that solid foundation. Let's make sure that we have a like good single leg support. Let's make sure that you're able to run and like jump and do some things without leaking. And then, that coupled with a really nutritious diet like will get you to where you want to be it's i think sometimes it's the fad of these quick fixes like i'm going to do this in three months i'm going to do this i think we have to look at it more of longevity and being easy on yourself being consistent with, yeah, with those I principles. Yeah, I agree more. I but. remember I was one of those people who was shocked. Uh, you know, I went from being an avid runner, uh, running five miles, uh, you know, in, in 40 minutes, many times a week. And, you know, that first run after, after like, it was probably, it took me six months to even start running again. Um, and I would, running is a, is a strong word for what it was. It was more like a jog, a very slow jog. Um, and I think I made it like a mile and a half and I was like, oh, I cannot do this. I was like, um, and I really felt bad about myself. I felt it was like very, um, you know, I felt really defeated. Um, and it's, I'm still not even close to where I was, uh, you know, pre having, ch- having children. Um, so yeah, take time, um, focus on nutrition. That's how I've been able to kind of feel better is also just like focusing a little bit more on nutrition, a little less on like the high intensity exercise that I used to do when I was in my twenties and early thirties. Um, and now I just can't do that anymore. Well, we, and we are seeing this like in the research, like if you're engaged in too much high intensity exercise, it's actually counterintuitive to like what your goals are and what you really want to get, like what you really want to achieve. Like, I'm somebody who always wants to like feel something, jump, run, like everything really heavy. So I'm like, oh gosh, toning it down is really hard. But if you're really thinking about building muscle, at, which we need to lose fat, it's like you don't need like, you don't always need to be getting your heart rate up high and like stressing yourself or you're increasing those cortisol levels. Like there are so many different ways to train. So I think something that I like to teach my patients a lot about is okay. um, habit stacking. So figuring out how to like turn diaphragmatic breathing into something that they could do every day or how to 
you know, when their baby's doing tummy time, like what are some exercises they can do on the floor for five minutes? And all of that stuff really does add up. It, you don't always need to get an hour of this high intensity exercise in. It's like we forget that it's the little things that add up over time, even though we, it doesn't seem like that yeah, the no, way, but it that's actually a great, is. That's a great point. And I think, I think walking and I really underrated because um, that's what I ended up having to do as well is just, I couldn't run anymore. So I was like, okay, I can't run, but let me do my 10,000 steps, put the baby in the stroller and I would just walk. And it was great. Cause I got, you know, time with the, the baby, the baby was outside, baby's happy and I'm getting my steps in. And so you, you know, you kind of are multitasking, but at the same time doing something physical. And I think the step counter is like a great motivator. Um, just doing like, I mean, even 10,000 steps, obviously, in the beginning was really hard. Um, but start with three, start with four, start with five, and break it up. doesn't have to be in one session. Um, that really, like, from my personal experience, walking, actually, never thought I'd be a, never thought I'd be a walker, but I'm a walker now after being a former runner. Um, and it, it, it works, and it's great, and it, it's helped me, um, you know, I, mean, I don't think I'll ever be back to where I was. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, I think that we can always be, you may not be what you yeah. were, but you could also be better than what you were. So I think that if, if we, if you like are instilling like healthy habits and you think about movement and weight loss and yourself in a different way, it's, you can still get to where you want to be. I just think that unfortunately we live in a culture where everything is so quick and we want things so quick and when it comes to body yeah. and healing, it's not always like that. Like the the principles of like are tried and true. Like nutrition, gentle consistency, like being kind yeah. with yourself. I definitely like all had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely was like, okay, this is my new normal, and that's okay. Um, but I will say, I feel like consistency is definitely the key, right? Like trying not to get too um, well. I need to be back this way, um, which which every person's unique and individual. So I don't want to speak for anyone else's experience, but for, for me personally, I definitely had to really like, okay, this is, this is okay. Um, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, but feeling healthy and feeling energetic, um, is, is just as important as, you know, whatever external thing you want to, but, um, the internal feeling is so important to just feel good and feel like you can be active again. Um, and I think that's what a lot of um, people are really looking for is just to become active again. Um, after you know potentially yeah, I mean, yeah. trauma <laughs> of birth i think you know and honestly that is something that i hear from a lot of people is that they think oh yeah i'm just gonna i'm gonna get back to this and i didn't realize i'd feel so bad or like why is this right. taking so long and my friend did it or what about this person on instagram how are they so thin it's like we're all different you're all beautifully and wonderfully made like we just have to be i think we have to be honest honest with other women too about like the reality of giving birth and some people like they have to go back to work actually what is it i saw this alarming statistic like one in four moms go back to work 10 days after giving birth so imagine if you had to do that yeah like how do you go back to work like get the right nutrition like now i need to, like i feel bad because i want to like get into this workout routine but i also have to figure out my relationship figure out my baby like women are amazing yeah we, we have are a lot amazing. going you're on watching like what are what's like the most common thing you see people doing that you're like oh, i wish you wouldn't do that um is there something like that that if someone listening would you know could kind of say oh i do that maybe i should stop i think oh gosh there's so many different things i wish that we had a better um, messaging in the fitness community about what actual core exercise is because a lot of times I think people get frustrated or bored by diaphragmatic breathing and stability but it literally is so key to progressing in all types of movement and I because I do get a lot of patients that will come in six months later they're leaking and they can engage their core, but they're seeing, you can see like their superficial abdomen or tummy poking out because the deep core isn't kicking in. And that's really where that breath comes in. So I would say if you have, like my recommendation for everybody is if they have a chance to see a pelvic therapist, they should, because we're the ones that are really looking at your, those muscles specifically. We're looking at how it interacts with your core and the whole body. 
And then we can kind of tell you like, actually things are great. Like get into this, get into that. And I, if you have the opportunity to do that, and there's so many resources now online where you could talk to someone online or follow some accounts that can kind of help you um, see like if you're passing little tests to get into more of a fit. I think type. <laughs> mobilizing that deep core is definitely hard. After you recommended that I go see, see, see someone, um, that was actually probably one of the hardest things was really focusing on what my deep core was when I was breathing. Cause it's, it's actually not that easy to engage if you're not used to it. And, um, something else that I see a lot is that people will still want to do pelvic floor contractions when they feel that they're leaking or when they feel, um, just like if they, they feel anything coming out, they're always going to want to like squeeze their pelvic floor. And, I think that before you really get into if you need to do Kegels, you should get that assessed because most moms do have a tight pelvic floor, like even like postpartum, because we have a tendency to have more of a weaker glute. And that's where that mom butt comes in. So we end up squeezing okay. our pelvic floor. So we need to make sure that we have like the length in that muscle first to really get the power from it to do what it needs to do to manage pressure to help with. Um, urinary leaking and if you do constipation and all that make your pelvic floor so, tighter then that could cause like pain in other ways right yeah a hundred percent like like it can cause hemorrhoids constipation issues pain with sex like it can actually cause leaking it can contribute to prolapse like a tight pelvic floor is not a healthy pelvic floor like you want your pelvic floor to have appropriate tone and i know in today's world it's like oh i have a tight you know and it's like well we don't need to be like overly tight where we're creating all these problems. <laughs> it seems taboo, but like there's no such thing. Like, I mean, there is such thing as too tight and it's called vaginismus. And we have to work on that with people. You definitely don't want to be Kegeling if you don't need to, because our muscle, we don't hold our bicep like this all day because that would be really bad on our arm That's and a, for function. So we have like to that. let it go. <laughs> all right. Well, we're, um, you know, this was really helpful. I really appreciate you jumping on and teaching us all about, um, PT and post-birth recovery. Um, any final words for anyone watching? Um, my final words would be, if you have any issues with pain, leaking, constipation, that any like fecal incontinence, if you've had birth and you've never seen a pelvic PT or OT, I'd recommend seeing someone because we have the luxury of being able to spend some time with you to sh go over all the things of your vulva, to look at your skin, to look at making sure you're doing things like contracting and relaxing appropriately, seeing if there's anything going on in the prolapse. Like if you have the opportunity to see someone, I'm like an advocate for my profession. I think that you yeah. should, cause we can, there's a yeah, lot. Awesome. We can do Thank for you so you. much. Thanks Dr. Babich. <laughs>